All right, great. Welcome to the second part of our Clean Summit. I'm Shauna Henley. I'm a backfighter with the Partnership for Food Safety Education, and I'll be covering for Shelly Feist while she's out talking to many other backfighters. So today we'll be talking about clean, and we're going to cover clean versus sanitizing and surface cleaning. Last episode for part one, we were talking about hand washing and kitchen towels. Next. So again, we're gonna be talking about cleaning versus sanitizing, and we'll also give you some extra information a little bit later on about CEUs and where you can find re-recordings of this. Next. So again, welcome. This is the Partnership for Food Safety Education, developed, um, and we develop and promote effective education programs to reduce foodborne illness risk for consumers. We are a nonprofit organization that relies on grants and contribu contributions. Next. And for some house cleaning, if you would like to ask a question, please type it in the question box on the right of the screen. And then after the webinar, you will receive a brief survey, and we hope that you fill that survey out. It'll help direct us for future webinars. And throughout our presentation today, we'll have a couple of polling questions sprinkled throughout. So if you can fill those out as they pop up, we would greatly appreciate that. Next. If you're looking for continuing education units, the one-hour CEU available from ANFP, CDR, and NIHA. You can download the certificate from the sidebar or provide a follow-up email, or you can also go to fightback.org and download the CEU paperwork under events tab and webinar recording. Next. And then for review since the last webinar, we discussed hand washing and that it's important to help prevent illness and spread of germs, and it helps battle the rise in antibiotic resistance. The last summit also discussed steps for proper hand washing, as well as hand sanitizers designed to kill germs. So damaging them, but not truly cleaning. We also discussed results from the study of bacterial occurrence in kitchen hand towels with Dr. Tamimi. Next. And what we'll cover today is improved knowledge and practice of surface cleaning and surface sanitizing in the home, understanding the difference between cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting, and known effective products for these processes. We'll also learn about interventions and resources that can help the consumer reduce risk from common pathogens in the home. Next. For our speakers today, we'll be starting off with Mindy Costello, followed by Dr. Akram Tamimi. And again, I am host, Dr. Shauna Henley. I am on the board for the partnership, and I work for the University of Maryland Extension. Next. So let me introduce Mindy Costello. She is a consumer information specialist and former standards development liaison for NSF International. National Center for Sustainability Standards, and she's been working with NSF for 11 years. Prior to joining NSF, she worked in public health as a sanitarian for a local health department and the state of Michigan. Ms. Costello also designs on-site water, wastewater disposal treatment systems for residential and small commercial properties in Southeast Michigan. Ms. Costello has a BS in environmental science from Lyman Briggs School at Michigan State University, a Master's of Science in Management from New England College, and has been a registered sanitarian through the state of Michigan for over 20 years. And with that, I will turn it over to Mindy for her presentation. Thank you, Shauna, I appreciate that. Um, hi, everyone. I just have uh, the agenda here. Um, these are the high-level topics that Shauna mentioned um, cleaning versus sanitizing, um, some home surface cleaning tips, and the surfaces of greatest concern. Um, a little teaser, do you know what the germiest places in your home and kitchen are? We'll find out at the end. 
Um, next slide. We're going to start off with our first poll question. And um, if you could um, make the selection on your screen. It's got, have you ever used a sanitizing product or made your own sanitizing solution? Uh, I make my own, I have bought one, I've made and bought one, and no, I don't use that stuff at all. Um, we're just gonna give this a couple of seconds here for everybody to get their votes in. It's amazing how many products are available out there now too that uh, you can use for sanitizing, which we're gonna talk about next. All right, here's our quick poll results. Um, I've bought a sanitizing product, 40%. I made and bought sanitizing products, 47%. It's very, very helpful information. If we could go to the next slide, please. So um, this section, we're gonna compare cleaning versus sanitizing, um, how to sanitize, storage of utensils. There's a tablet cell phone study I wanna highlight and talk a little bit about toys. Um, so some important questions that we're gonna try to answer. Um, what are cleaning versus sanitizing? Why do you need to sanitize? And how do you sanitize? Next slide. So first off, when to clean and when to sanitize. It might seem obvious, but I just wanna highlight cleaning. Um, we have a definition for cleaning, actually. The NSF International Health Guard book that we use for um, professional food service training says the process of cleaning is removing visible soil from the surface. Dried food, spills, you know, shining and getting rid of like a film on your glass top, stove, um, dirt, dust, you know, all that stuff that cakes into your oven. That's cleaning. Um, so in contrast, Sanitizing is the process of reducing the number of live organisms on a surface to levels which are considered safe. In this case, you know, we've got raw meat juice that oozed out of a package, you know, someone sick sneezed all over your countertop. Uh, I won't go into spit, um, but sickness, you know, somebody is sick and they've touched your refrigerator handle, your faucet in your bathroom or your kitchen. Um, just the spread of germs in general. You could have raw meat that, you know, popped out of your um, pan on the stove when you're cooking, ha you know, ground burger or something. Um, so it's important to note a couple of things. Surfaces have to be cleaned before they're sanitized. Um, so an example would be like a cutting board. You know, you cut the chicken up. You really want to clean that first and then sanitize it. Um, it's also very important to remember that more sanitizer or cleaner is not always better. These products contain a, an ingredient that when it's used improperly can be hazardous. The next thing I wanted to talk about is just a quick story. Um, I talked to a lady from a daycare center and she asked me, you know, the, the regulatory body told me I have to use this. I don't like chemicals, this is her words. I don't like harsh chemicals. So it's really important as educators that you know we help people understand not only what it is but why do they need to use it. So you know the purpose of sanitizing, you know it's it's to kill the bacteria to to eliminate the spread of the germs. All right, next slide. Um, some obvious cleaning things here: warm, hot, soapy water. Um, you know, there's always a vinegar and water solution that some people like to use. Um, some people like baking soda and water to make kind of a gritty paste. Um, as a friendly reminder, soaps are not sanitizers. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to highlight is the EPA has this program called uh, Safer Choice. Uh, people who want to look for a product that has um, been evaluated for its human health and environmental impacts can look on the EPA Safer Choice list under the category all-purpose cleaners and um, they have plenty of products that they've evaluated under there and uh, give you some choices if that's what you're looking for. Typically these products are not the EPA Safer Choice, typically those are not sanitizers. 
Um, next. So sanitizing by submerging a, a kitchen product, um, cutting boards, big pots and pans, um, serving trays, you know, say you're taking the chicken out to the barbecue grill on a plate, you know, that's definitely going to want to, you're going to want to sanitize that. Um, and I know the fight back has some information about making sure you change plates or make sure you sanitize that plate first before you put the cooked food back on it. So what you want to do if you're going to use a homemade solution, you're going to use a gallon of water, which is 16 cups. Uh, for one tablespoon of bleach, you're going to want to use a household bleach that is unscented and without additives, meaning um, added, uh, you know, detergent for something, you know, just bleach. Um, you're going to submerge the product into the solution for one to three minutes, rinse it thoroughly and allow it to air dry. So uh, a quick tip, if you have a giant pot, a giant cutting board, you can put it in for one to three minutes on one side and flip it over. Just something to think about. So, because a lot of people will say, well, it won't fit in my sink. Um, and that, that's one way to kind of get around it. There are other ways and we'll talk about those next. All right, next slide. Uh, if you have a sanitizing dishwasher, um, by that I mean it has a cycle on it that says sanitizing. Um, you can use your dishwasher or if you have a sanitizing dish detergent, you would need to read the directions for both. Make sure you follow them to ensure that sanitizing occurs. Another important fact is if the item is not dishwasher safe, obviously this is not a good choice. So um, let me see if there's anything else. Oh, so standard 184. Um, NSF International is a standards developer and we facilitate the development of American national standards. We have a standard for residential dishwashers where we verify uh, when we certify products that the dishwasher on its sanitizing cycle will kill a five log reduction of bacteria. Um, it's, it's another way for you to have a product that you can ass be assured will get rid of or kill the bacteria. Uh, next, please. So sanitizing with spray and wipes. Um, another obvious step, read the directions. Does it say there's a rinse um, required after the product is used, um, depending on if it's contact with food? Uh, is there a wait time? Some products I notice will say, you know, apply thoroughly and wait 10 minutes. Um, before rinsing. Um, you also want to read the fine print of whether or not it's okay to use on your granite or your stainless steel. Um, some products are, um, will say test in a small inconspicuous area. Um, and then you can also use your homemade sanitizing solution of your one gallon of water with one tablespoon of bleach, put it in a spray bottle and follow those same directions. Spray it on, wait one to three minutes and then follow with a rinse if it's going to have food contact. Okay, next. So this is um, something I wanted to highlight about um, storage of utensils and kitchen items. In commercial kitchens, they have requirements, you know, for uh, utensils and pots and pans. So I just want to highlight some of these that we could do at home or even when we're having a get together to help, um, you know, eliminate those opportunities for germs to spread. We have uh, single use um, flatware or uh, plastic, you know, spoons and forks. Um, you want to always, if you're putting them in a cup, put the handles up. It may seem obvious, but this will help prevent the spread of germs, people touching the food end of the utensil. Um, it, it also, uh, so let's see, storage. So in a drawer, you know, if you have your, uh, your spoons and your uh, spatulas and things like that, just put the handles all in the same direction. So people that may come to your home and use those items or kids that stick their hands in there may not, you know, they won't be touching the food contact end. If you're hanging things, um, pots, pans, utensils, some of those fancy hooks that you use, it's important to, if possible, keep them away from dust and germs. And uh, 
this is the best one here, not under the sink. So why do you think you can't store things under the sink? I'm sure a lot of you are saying, I know, I know. Because of the con potential contamination from your sink drain or the drain that runs under your sink, you don't ever want to store even your largest pots under your sink. You may have a drip that you're not aware of. It leaks into your pot. It dries. You use the pot. Now you've got sewer in your pot. So we just want to make sure that we never store any of our kitchen contact items under the sink. Okay, next. So the FDA study by Amy Lando and Michael, and I apologize if I mispronounce Bazaco, uh, they did a study about um, tablet and cell phone use in the kitchen. It's very interesting that they, you know, people use these items in their kitchen for recipes or tips or watch a YouTube video or something, or even record their own videos. You know, how many of them are washing their hands after touching their device? Are they spreading germs? Where are the germs hiding in their cell phone case, you know? or other areas. So it was very interesting. We've got a link here to the study if you wanna read more about it. And um, from my understanding, the next step of the study will be to actually swab and do more research into the areas around the kitchen and the devices and find out what germs are there and uh, where they're hiding. Next, we're gonna do our second poll question. Do you read the labels on your cleaning products and follow the directions? Now, it'd be helpful to be honest here. I mean, if you just grab the product and start spraying, that's okay. Um, but if you do read the directions and follow them, you know, let us know. As I mentioned earlier, some of these products have very detailed instructions and they will even highlight sanitize, to sanitize, do this and this and this, you know, spray it, wait 10 minutes, rinse. Um, so it's really important to kind of look at those and uh, make sure that you uh, have the right product for the right purpose. Now we're going to leave this open for just another second or so. There we go, 61%. Sometimes read and follow the directions on your cleaning products. I would probably fall into that category as well. Um, for the 35% that always do it, you are doing the right thing. And the 3%, um, I don't have anything to say about that. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. The next slide, we're gonna talk about some uh, cleaning and sanitizing toys. Um, there are uh, certified washers and dryers, just to highlight this option, um, that have been tested and verified to kill bacteria on absorbent toys or laundry. Um, but in this case, we're talking about toys. Uh, surface cleaning can be done with a spray or sanitizing solution and air dry. You always wanna read the, um, you always wanna read the um, label and tag to make sure that you're not gonna ruin the toy. And um, the last thing is just, um, you can do the submerge or you can do the spray, as I said. And the frequency depends on the use. I mean, if these toys get used a lot, they may need to be sanitized more often. And okay, that's it for that one. Next slide, please. I just want to highlight pets. We all love our pets, whether they be a bird or a hamster or a dog or cats or a lizard. You know, it's really important to make sure we keep those dishes clean that they are eating out of. And, um, you know, you want to clean it first and then sanitize it. You can use the submerger spray method. And you want to read the tag or label on that um, bowl if, the, if it's still available or just pay attention to the surface and make sure you use an appropriate cleaner for that type. Um, and, you know, this also includes your pet toys. So make sure you clean them. Your pets want to have a toy that is clean and not full of uh, dirt and soil from playing with it too much. Next slide. So let's just do a quick summary. Uh, a couple of new tips and a summary here. 
Always read the directions on your cleaning products. Use a sanitizing cycle on your dishwasher or uh, washer or dryer for absorbent items. Take apart things like blender gaskets, um, you know, handles that come off of spatulas. People don't think of those things, but bacteria can be um, stubborn and get right in there and grow, and we don't want to spread that bacteria to our food. So you use a sanitizing solution, uh, one gallon of water with a tablespoon of bleach, submerge one to three minutes, rinse thoroughly, and allow to air dry. You can also use the sanitizing solution in a spray bottle and uh, be, be sure to rinse after the contact time and allow to air dry, or you can use a paper towel if that would be quicker for the item that you need to use. So next slide, we're gonna talk about the germs in the home and the kitchen. Uh, next slide. This um, NSF has done several germ studies, um, 2011 and 2013, and then we've done another recent one of college dorms, and we're getting ready to work on another one that I can't yet talk about, but I'm excited about. Um, so I'm just gonna go over some tips, you know, where do germs stay and where do they grow? Dark, moist environments, um, items that can be in direct food contact or indirect contact, hard to clean areas, um, things like we just talked about, things that aren't disassembled, you know, the gasket on your blender, the handle on your spatula are the two that come to mind. Um, Cross-contamination, so you just wanna make sure that you're not spreading germs around your kitchen. Our, our favorite one is don't wash your chicken. Um, so uh, the other thing I was just going to mention is from the 2011 study, we found the sponges and coffee reservoirs were one of the top 10 germiest places in the home. And the reason we found that is maybe because people aren't cleaning them as often as they should. And the 2013 study revealed their, um, that we're just not cleaning things as sufficiently as we should. And, to prevent illness. So the germiest item in the home was found to be drum roll, sponge, or dish rag, uh, probably because people don't change them often enough um, or you know, put them in the microwave for a minute and sanitize them. And the germiest item from our kitchen study was the refrigerator water dispenser. And with that, the last slide is some links to some resources that you may want to look into further for more information. Um, and I, that is it for me. Great. Thank you, Mindy. I know when I was growing up, I always told my parents air drying was better for the dishes to avoid that. So I'm glad this helped <laughs> confirm it years later. So our next speaker is going to be Dr. Akram Tamini. And we'll come back and answer the questions that people had for you, Mindy, at the end of the second presentation. So our next speaker, you may remember him from the last summit, is Dr. Akram Tamini. He's a professor of practice of the Department of Biosystems Engineering at the University of Arizona. Dr. Tamimi earned a BS in Civil Engineering from Roger Williams University in Rhode Island, a BS in Biosystems Engineering from the University of Arizona. He has a Master's in Soil Mechanics and Foundations and Engineering from Tufts University in Massachusetts, and a Doctorate in Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering from the University of Arizona. Dr. Tamimi traveled, worked, taught and conducted research in Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and North America. Dr. Tamimi has a solid background in engineering, microbiology, mathematics, statistical methods and data analysis, modeling, quantitative microbial risk assessment, and programming, including developed skills for number crunching to discover trends in data, numerical analysis, problem solving, programming and developing algorithms to solve different scientific research and engineering problems. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to our second presenter. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, great. Um, I apologize. Maybe there's a little background. I, I had to travel, so um, 
I'm actually sitting in a place there is a little noise, so I apologize for that. Hopefully, this will be clear. But um, the study that we actually ran at the University of Arizona um, had an objective of um, studying, studying the movement of viruses throughout a household and uh, the impact of alcohol-based uh, hand sanitizer on reducing the movement and the exposure to the viruses by, by household members. Next, please. So just background information, we did not really use viruses um, uh, to inoculate um, you know, the hands or the fomites um, in the study. We use MS2. It's a bacteriophage. It's very similar to hand um, I'm sorry, the viruses, um, enteric viruses and respiratory uh, uh, viruses, and um, the same size, the same characteristics, and it's usually used in place of viruses when you do risk assessment and um, modeling, and you know you look at the virus movement within a particular environment. Uh, um, so you know it mimics the rhinovirus, which is the common cold virus, and norovirus, you know, for which causes diarrhea and many other enteric viruses. So whatever results we get from an MS2, which is really not pathogenic, so nobody gets sick uh, from the study, um, you know, it applies to other viruses. So, um, you know, in the following slides, uh, you know, we prefer, I, I will be referring to the MS2 concentration, MS2 as, as the virus. Next, please. Uh, so what we did, we 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 propagated um, the, the MS2, and we saved it at um, uh, stored it at four degrees C until we used it. And um, you know we had uh, the virus added to hands of one of the adults in the household, and uh, we had uh, multiple household multiple houses that we conducted. And uh, so this is the information in regard how we did the, the experiment. So all individuals received one milliliter. Of this, you know, of the cell and suspension, one of which only had the virus on it, and uh, the virus was put on a hand, uh, uh, which is really the MS2 here. I just want to emphasize that really a virus. It's a mimic of a virus. We put it on one hand of the member in the household, and uh, you know, the other individuals um, got the same, you know, one millimeter. We asked them to rub their hands, and we just asked them to go about their business. This was conducted during a weekend day. And um, and um, so you know we asked the family members to stay uh, in the house. Next, please. So we we had seven houses, seven households uh, within families that have at least two children, ages two to eighteen, and um, we select them randomly from a pool of um, available houses that we recruited for this purpose, and the hands of one. Of the you know the, the member uh, family member that we inoculated, we added contaminated their hand with one times ten to the eighth um, MS2 bacteriophage, which is you know if you want to count it, we had like a um, hundred million um, viruses on their hand. So at a specific time during the day, um, you know we had it at eight hours, um, and at um, four hours, you know the hands of each member, and we talk in when we say the hand, it's hand, it's really the ten fingers. Um, we we um, you know they we ask them to go about their business, make sure they they touch uh, twenty frequent uh, twenty surfaces, twenty uh, contaminated uh, surfaces, and that was really the one of the control. Next, please. So those are the full mines that we are looking at. You know, we, you know, in the room there are kit in the kitchen. Those are the utensils um, that we, you know the places, the surfaces that we we. The swab uh, for testing, the bathroom, um, the living room, uh, the bedrooms, the phone, and the entryway, which is the front door knob, to see you know how the viruses are actually moving within the house to and and how the contamination is happening. So for the control, there was no intervention, so we only contaminated the hands with the breathings. Next please. So. You know, the same seven households were selected again. So the first time we did it without an intervention. So we asked the people just to go about their business. We took samples, uh, we swapped the surfaces, the hands, and we had we had data. So then after that, um, you know, we did that and we contaminated the same exact thing. We did exactly the same thing, but the families were selected from horses, 
houses were given 354 ml bottles of 70% alcohol-based hand sanitizer. And there is a brand name here that I'm not going to mention. It's an industry. It's a regular, you know, it's a famous um, um, sanitizer that is used on a regular basis. We were testing it, and that's what we're doing. So, it, you know, the hand sanitizer plays in the kitchen, the bathroom, in the nurseries, and we give them, in the, you know, other sizes, 56 millimeters, or, um, you know, each of the members of the family who are over 12 years old. We train them on how to use it um, by, you know, the hand sanitizer specific times um, every, you know, in, in eight hours, uh, how many times they use it. And we apply enough, sen- you know, we, we train them to apply enough sanitizer to keep the hands wet for 15 to 20 seconds. Um, and this is what's recommended by the industry who was making um, this, producing this. Rub the sanitizer on a thorough uh, until it is thoroughly until it's dry, and you know just go about you know their business and at specific times and we will see those I'll, I'll mention those uh, during the day hands of the family members and the 24 mics that I presented earlier in the house were actually were actually swapped and tested for concentration of the virus. Next please. So let's take a look at the results. So, so you know, we had a control and we had an intervention. So the control gives us a high a high number. Next, please. And uh, the, the intervention where we ask the people to, you know, use a sanitizer. And, you know, this is, there are four phases in this study. Phase one, we did sampling every four hours uh, with three uses. So we asked the users to do, I mean, the household members to actually use the sanitizer for three times, three three times in four hours. And if you look, uh, if you look, there was, um, there is, um, you know, this is just a concentration. This is a graph that shows, uh, you know, how the, sanitiz- the sanitizer actually reduced the count of the virus, um, uh, the, you know, from the control to the intervention. So the control is no treatment, so there is no sanitizer. The intervention is where we, you know, that sanitizer was used. In this case, for, uh, you know, in four hours, um, you know, uh, we sampled in four hours, and we asked them to use uh, during during that four hours to be up six weeks. Phase two, it's the same thing, but you know, we act, we sampled after eight hours, and we asked them to use uh, the, the hand sanitizer three times. Next, please. Phase three is four hours, but we asked them to do it one time. So, so next, please. Uh, phase four is eight hours we asked them to use it once. So so the timing of the swabbing is four hours and eight hours, and we asked them to use the sanitizer one time or three times. Next, please. So, you know, this is, if you look at, the, the, you know, the concentration for each of the phases, and um, if you look, that we calculate a geometric mean, there is a control and intervention, the number of observations you can tell, and the average, and if you look at, the top, there is a lot in reduction. You know, how much did we really reduce? Um, how many logs did we reduce? And if you look at this with a 95% confidence interval, it's, um, you know, we reduce it really between one, one and a half logs to, uh, I mean, one and a half um, uh, logs to about two logs. So an average of 1.75 logs. Um, and uh, so a percent reduction, but, you know, it varied between, you know, 98 to 99.69. And if you look at this, the phases, um, this, you, you know, the phases, um, it, you know, the reduction increases, and I think it has something to do with, the, you know, the members in the, the household, um, you know, getting more aware of how to use the sanitizer and how to rub their hands and make sure that it is appropriately done. So that's, I, that's really my, 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 uh, uh, conclusion on this or, or justification. Now, we did ANOVA analysis of variance, and we find out, found out that, you know, there is really a significant difference between, um, you know, the control and the intervention. There's a significant difference between using the uh, hand sanitizer and not using it at all. And you can tell from the p-value, which is less than 0.05. So if it's less than 0.05, there is significant difference. Next, please. So, you know, let's take a look at the fomites, the surfaces, what happened. So for the bathrooms, uh, the bathroom surface, please, next please. 
if you look, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three, you would find out that there's, you know, for phase one, you know, it's, you know, it, most of the time you're really seeing a lot of reduction. Uh, but, you know, some of, you know, in phase two, you have one, two, three, four, five of the fomite surfaces in the bathroom still have high, 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 high level of, uh, uh, of contamination. So next, please. Um, and this is, those are the results. And you can take a look at um, percent reduction um, as an average, and you can take a look that there is significant difference. But you know, if you look at the log reduction, the log reduction is really, it's really, um, you know, it varies depending on the, the phase, and um, so it varies between one and a half, you know, for, for phase four, one point six, let's say, to two point five. So there is a lot of variation. So if you look at that, that's about 99% reduction. So it's really about two uh, log reductions. And, you know, that's usually the case. Uh, next, please. And I'll come to a conclusion at the very end to show you, you know, the different surfaces. You know, for the bedroom surfaces, you observe almost the same thing. Next, please. You know, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four in pictures, what happened, you know, for, you know, if you do, you know, you know, if you test at four hours, you test at eight hours, and if you have a sanitizing a sanitizer used once or three times, six weeks. And if you look, you know, there is the percent reduction, and uh, there is significant difference, of course. But if you look at the percent reduction, it's on the average about, you know, you have 94 percent, and and um, um, and that's probably about one part reduction. So so. So, you know, the log reduction is, is something that I want to comment on at the very end. Next, please. Um, you know, for the kitchen surfaces, you have the switch handle, all those, kitchen light, the dishwasher, et cetera, et cetera, those fomites and surfaces. Let's take a look at the results, please. Next, please. Uh, phase one, phase two, phase three. So it's actually, you know, you can tell you're really reducing the viruses dramatically. Uh, using the hand sanitizer. Next, please. And if you look at the reduction, we are in the 99%, a little more than 99% reduction. So we're talking about a two log reduction on average. And if you look at the p value, there is significant difference between using the hand sanitizer to not use it. Next, please. Living room surfaces, the TV, TV remotes, and the light switch. Next, please. You know, the same thing, the same picture, you know, now, um, if you look, those are really, you know, you know, in, 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 the, in, in those, you see surfaces that are less because we're not using really all the surfaces. Um, I, I mean, you know, the number of surfaces for this area is, is limited, and but still, you can tell that we're really knocking out those viruses using the hand sanitizer. Please. And here again, you see the you know 97 and, and the 99. So you know phase four is really the most efficient, and, and because you use it three times in eight hours. And uh, so, but if you look at the log reduction again, you know it's an average of about two. Um, and there is a huge gap for the, the phase three and phase four. But you know statistically speaking, and you know it's a you know, statistical difference. There is significant difference um, in statistics, uh, statistical difference between using and not using. Next, please. Uh, specific questions. There are questions that, that we want to, want to answer. Next, please. You know, here, if you look at the question, is there a significant difference between households with pets and those without pets? And there isn't really. If there is no statistical significant difference. Um, for in the household, if they have pets or if they don't have pets. Next, please. The next step, the next question is: Is there significant difference between females and and males? Because we swab in the hands of females and males. And if you look, you know, at during phase three, there was. And if you look at this p value, it's 0.0457. So there's significant difference, statistical significant difference between uh, for phase three between. Um, you know, uh, um, uh, between uh, a control and the use, you know, using and not using the hand sanitizer. Next, please. 
um, the next question is, is there a significant difference between children? If there are children less than five years old or older than five years old. And if you look, most of those really, there is no significant difference. So children don't really play um, a significant difference, uh, statistical significant difference for using or not using as hand sanitizer. On the finger, you know, on the hands concentration of um, of um, uh, um, yeah, yeah, it's significant difference between you know children less than five or not greater than five, and you're talking about you know all all the the the, the, the members' hands, next please, household hands. Is there a significant difference between children and adults? And and there is there is no statistical significant difference between. The, you know, the hands of the children and the adults. Next, please. So, you know, in conclusion, before before the questions, if you look at the numbers here, there is really significant difference between using a hand sanitizer and not using it. However, you really need to be careful because when you have high high loads of viruses, you know, we're looking at two log reductions. When we say two log reductions, if you have a, you know, 10,000 viruses on the hand, and and you use a hand sanitizer, the way we, we described it here in the study, you will be able to reduce the 10,000 to 100 uh, viruses. So it's not really significant in regard to the reduction. I want to knock out all the viruses off my hands when I use a hand sanitizer. And that tells you that the hand sanitizer is statistically significant, but if you have a high dose of, you know, of, of viruses, um, somebody sneezed or you sneezed and, you know, you have cold, um, you really should wash your hands over using hand sanitizer. This is my, this is what we, you know, my, my conclusion on this. I'll stop and I, I will answer any questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, for the questions, we're still taking questions, but for our guest, Dr. Tamimi, one of the questions was, some hand sanitizers have directions to wash hands before applying. Mm -hmm. Were hands washed at any time during the control or intervention? Um, uh, they were instructed um, uh, to actually just go about their life on a regular basis. So if they needed to wash their hands, they probably did. So we, we did not intervene on you know on what they do and so so during during the day. They they just go about their business. They go to the bathroom, they use the bathroom, probably they wash their hands. So they yes, the the answer is yes. And then Mindy, uh from your presentation we have a question of Let's see, what is the best way to actually clean and possibly sanitize the water filter in your refrigerator? Well, it's actually the water dispenser itself, and we do have instructions on how to do that on our website. It's um, available at nsfconsumer.org. Um, I can get the link for the team and make sure I share it. Generally speaking, there's instructions for your refrigerator on how to take that apart and make sure that the straw um, that delivers the water uh, doesn't, isn't containing, um, I believe it was uh, mold and yeast. Um, and outside of the uh, dispenser as well. So I can get that information and share it to the partnership as one of the resources. Great, thank you. And then another question for you. On the slide titled Sanitizing by Submersion, we had a question of why the recommendation was sanitize and then rinse. Some people have usually rinsed and then sanitized. So maybe just some clarification around the recommendation. Yeah, so let me let me talk about that really quick. So with a commercial kitchen, you're gonna do the wash with soapy water, rinse off the soap, 
sanitize and air dry. The reason being is that that sanitizer is very controlled in a commercial kitchen. For household cleaning, we're buying bleach off the shelf with potentially variable amounts of active ingredient in it. So without knowing for sure what that level of active ingredient is, um, our scientist in the Applied Research Center, Dr. Christine Green, had recommended that we, uh, you know, tell consumers to do a rinse and then an air dry. And that way, we would help eliminate any residue on the um, food, on the pan or the pot or the cutting board that might still be there if they bought a bleach that was closer to the 8% active ingredient versus a 5%. So that's kind of the reasoning behind the rinse is just an extra layer of protection for consumers when they're using their own solution. Great, thank you. And Dr. Tamimi, um, how does hand sanitizer results from your study compare to existing hand washing studies in terms of log reduction? Any thoughts? And can you repeat that in the time, please? Sure. So how do the results of your hand sanitizer study compare to the literature out there about just hand washing, soap, water, paper towel, and the log reduction? Um, we did not look at that, but I can tell you hand washing is really the way to do it. I mean, if you can wash your hands, you really wash your hands. You should not depend on hand sanitizer. From the results we see, you know, two, two log reductions is not really that great. Um, if you can wash your hands, wash your hands. And if you want to, after that, use a hand sanitizer, you remove it. When you wash your hands, you really remove it from some viruses and bacteria. Now you use a hand sanitizer, um, you, you just add an, another layer of protection if you wish. Um, we did not really look at that, and this was really a specific study that we conducted um, or as I indicated, for a manufacturer of them, and uh, or hand sanitizer. So we, yeah, yeah, and, you know, and, and I, I answered the question earlier that they were allowed to wash their hands. You need to remember that, you know, they wash their hands, but they still walking around a contaminated environment. You know, the, the surfaces have viruses, so they were also uh, transferring the, the, the viruses from the surfaces to their hands. So on a later stage, they, if they wash their hands, I mean, if they um, ha use the hand sanitizer, they should be reduced and, um, you know, the, the, count, the virus counts from uh, that they collected from the different surfaces. Great. And then, um, Mindy, this question is for you. Regarding label reading, since regular household bleach sold since 2012 often may be noted on the label to be 8.25% sodium hypochlorite rather than 5.25% to 6.25%. Um, why hasn't the handout for children's toys, et cetera, been adjusted to reflect the current label advice of checking the chlorine level or concentration? And if it is the 8.25% sodium hypochlorite than using two teaspoons per gallon rather than three teaspoons or one tablespoon per gallon as found on the current handout for this webinar. So I guess um, this person is curious to know a little bit more about the varying percentages and maybe how best to communicate what the different percentages means to consumers in terms of properly sanitizing certain household items. So if I'm correct. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I was on mute. Can, what, is that for me, is that a question for me, to me? We'll have uh, Mindy answer that question first, and if you have thoughts, we'll come back to you if that works. Oh, oh, oh. Then, then fine, I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're good. Thanks. If I'm understanding correctly, the handout that you're referring to is a fight back handout. Um, and it's something that could be updated and reviewed by the team. 
when I did work with our microbiolo microbiologist, Lisa Yakis and Dr. Green on this, we were assuming variable percentages of bleach are available on the shelf. And I was talking to Shauna before we started the webinar and I just wanted to note something that I saw that um, the bleach I purchased from the grocery store has no active ingredient listings or percentages, which is really strange to me. So um, I think that in the case of NSF International, who I'm representing, we have erred on the side of caution to help consumers protect themselves with those variabilities that are available in the store. From a technical scientific standpoint, absolutely it could be mapped out so that people are using, um, you know, a test strip if that was the way that um, they wanted to go to make sure what percentage of active ingredient they had and adjust their amount of, of bleach per water that way. But from a general consumer education perspective, this is what we've decided to present. So I'm happy to go into more detail, but I think that's kind of the answer we can give on this on this platform for now. Great, thank I would you. Like to, I, I, would, I would like to add to this, you know, when you're looking at percent uh, reduction, percent reduction, if you look at the literature, it depends how you define it, you know, uh, and they define it in a completely different way. Sometimes they use averages, sometimes they use um, arithmetic mean or geometric mean, and it, they give you different results, whatever, it, and it, sometimes if the, the difference over the higher value. So it's not reported usually in the literature how they can calculate the percent difference. And there is no universal um, definition of a percent reduction, uh, of the, you know, percent reduction. So it can be deceiving, the 99%, um, you know. So it's really how it is defined. And you should, you know, when, you know, microbiologists, you know, or anybody, you know, if you read that and you ask the question, how was it really calculated? because it depends how it is calculated and can be a little That's really something that the people need, the consumers need to look at and make sure that they understand what those numbers, where those numbers come from. That's a great point. And Dr. Tamimi, um, another question for you. How long do hand sanitizers last? Is one container only good for so long? Just because you will see an expiration date on hand sanitizer bottles. Well, what, what, we, what I can tell you, um, the, the hand sanitizer bottles that, that we use, them, them, they were fresh. They came from the manufacturer, and um, we used them there, and then probably within probably a month from manufacturing. So, you're asking me about um, about um, expiration date. I don't really have information. Um, of the efficacy of you know the efficiency of um, um, you know it, you know it's 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 alcohol based and you know alcohol probably lasts for two years so um, you know within two years I, I think um, alcohol it's, um, it's you know efficiency it's efficiency will start to reduce so with if you putting more materials with it I don't really know what the effects uh, of that and that's that's an excellent question you know. Um, do they have um, expiration dates? I don't believe the follow have any expiration dates. And then a question to both of you. I'll ask uh, Mindy to answer first. But what can backfighters like us do to help better educate consumers to get into the mindset or just better understand that cleaning and sanitizing are two different things? A lot of people think cleaning and sanitizing are the same step. So Thanks, Shana. Cindy, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I just started working on um, a consumer web page on the NSF consumer page, that um, resources section, that would address this very thing. And I think it would be important to have a little handout as well. Um, as far as what we can do, um, you know, refer to those definitions and, and ensure people, like we talked about, what is it and why is it important? You know, cleaning is getting rid of the soil. Sanitizing is killing the bacteria. Why is it important? We don't want to spread germs. I mean, it has to be simple and easy, but, you know, 
forthcoming as far as the what and the how and the why? You know, it's, it's uh, again, it's it's really awareness. You know, just awareness, um, and I think um, this falls also on the industry on on really just make sure people understand. You know, they use hand sanitizer, what it does, and you washing your hands, what it actually does, and um, you know, something really a little misleading. You know, a lot of people, for example, liquid 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 uh, soap. Liquid soap, you know, if, it, if you fill the bottle, you know, a lot of, there are some studies that say, you know, there is bacteria growth and there is resistance. But you see, it doesn't really matter because when, you, when you're when you washing your hands with, um, you know, bottled soap, um, even if there is bacteria living there, soap only removes the materials. You know, it dissolves it and removes it from the hand. It doesn't really necessarily kill it. And sanitizer supposedly kills it and reduces the count. So, you know, there is a lot of misinformation, and I, I think it's just awareness and uh, digging for the right information, verify it, and provide it to, you know, to the consumers. Great. Thank you both for your comments on that question. Um, next slide, please. Again, if you're looking for a continuing education unit, you can download your certificate from the sidebar now, a follow up email or go to our website under the events tab. Next, please. Please fill out the survey that will pop up immediately after the webinar is over. Your responses help inform us about what other topics we should cover in future webinars. Next. We'd also like you to check out some of our resources and if there's other sorts of fact sheets and items you're looking for, let us know, please. Next. And we would like to thank our Backfighter community connectors. Without their help, we wouldn't be able to hold the webinars. Next, please. And I know personally that I really enjoy listening to the webinars and learning some new things. Next, please. So hopefully, um, if you're not aware, Part one of the summit is already on the Fight Back website, and the second part of the summit of this webinar should be up soon. Next, please. And I'd really like to thank our guest speakers, Mindy and Dr. Tamimi. We had a great time learning about cleaning versus sanitizing, and we hope to see you soon. With that, we'll close our webinar, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Bye.